بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا وإمامنا وحبيبنا أبي القاسم محمد بن عبد الله وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي I praise Allah Almighty and I send prayers and blessings upon Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم his noble family righteous companions and all those that follow them with right guidance until the day of judgment Amin glory be to you O Allah <coughs> excuse me no knowledge have we except that which you have taught us indeed you are the all-knowing the all-wise I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from us to make our deeds sincere I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enable me to complete this talk as in the best way possible because as you might hear there's a slight problem with the voice but inshallah if my voice somehow uh, loses out eventually I might have to continue in writing that was a joke wake up guys um, <clears throat> but God willing I'll try to finish it inshallah I sincerely apologize for the delay uh, it is through no fault of the organizers but my own even though I may blame it on extenuating circumstances as I usually do may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us all may Allah bless you for being here at this time may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase you in knowledge in faith in piety and implementation of the beautiful principles of Islam my brothers and sisters <clears throat> We're here to talk about a very special personality and the unique one at that. And all of the Khulafa al Rashidin are special personalities and they have this unique characteristic which is al Rashidin. They are the rightly guided ones. And this is unique to them. This is not something that anyone else can claim. The only ones that can claim that are those four and you might say one more four and one more one more being whom is there a fifth Khalifa Rashid yes save my voice ask questions let them do the talking is there a fifth Khalifa Rashid, brothers and sisters, it's not a rhetorical question. I'm waiting for your reply. Yes or no? Just say, if there's no, say no. There's no fifth rightly guided Khalifa. Is there or not? Huh? Subhanallah, silence. Sisters, don't be shy. If the, 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 the boys don't know it, the girls will know it. Hmm. Never heard of a fifth Khalifa? What's that? Omar ibn Abdul Aziz. So there is a fifth. Kind of. Any other uh, opinions? Hmm? Didn't the Prophet say the, the Khilaf al Rashida will be 30 years? So the four Khalifas span 30 years minus six months so what's left the six months of al-hasan right the grandson of the prophet وسلم, who the the prophet وسلم, said that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will use him in order to mend relations and to make peace between two large groups of the muslims right Mind you, as the brother said, there, it's a popular opinion that Umar ibn Abdul Aziz is the uh, fifth Khalifa, or at least that he is similar to Al Khulafa al Rashidin in that his time where he ruled was similar to the rightly guided characteristic of the rule of Al Khulafa al Rashidin. But maybe a more correct and a more popular opinion would be to say al Hassan deserves this characteristic even more especially since the Prophet ﷺ said that al Khilafa 
Al Rashida is going to be uh, for 30 years. And the 30 years would include the six months of uh, Al Hassan. So these four rightly guided Khalifas have been mentioned by the Prophet and the Prophet gave them this characteristic and the Prophet does not speak in vain or of his own volition. This is from Wahi. And despite the fact that you may hear some things today and soon in the next talk that may seem to indicate that the time of that Khalifa was not as peaceful as the time of the first two that in no way negates the quality of Ar-Rashidah when describing that Khilafa if there were trials and tribulations this in no way vitiates or devalues the Khilafa and the rule of the Khalifa them, themselves. Okay? The Khalifas themselves. They all were Khulafa al-Rashidin and they ruled upon Minhaj al nubuwa The way of al nubuwa of the Prophethood. This man, Uthman ibn Affan, radiyallahu anhu wa arda, Uthman lived in Mecca and he is Mecki and he is from Quraysh, he is Qurashi and he is from the tribe of um, Bani Umayyah so he is Umayyad he is Amawi Uthman ibn Affan lived in Mecca and was the beloved son of Mecca Uthman ibn Affan radiyallahu anhu wa arda was so loved in Mecca that it kind of reminds us of the character of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself in the same way that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and maybe you can allow me to reduce my voice even if I get excited because I'm feeling the quality is starting to diminish even if uh, or the Prophet sallallahu as much as he was loved amongst his people before an nubuwa before becoming a bona fide prophet he was loved and he was uh, named as sadiq al-amin and they trusted him and he was a personality that people had consensus over in the same way Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu an had the same quality and was loved amongst the Meccans and amongst Quraysh and it's interesting therefore that in a hadith which may not reach the level of Sahih and some uh, scholars may have considered it da'if the Prophet وسلم, said when he saw uh, his uh, daughter taking care of Uthman so he said to her take care of him my dear daughter he is the closest to me in character an interesting narration based on the, the, the notion that we just mentioned how much Uthman ibn Affan was loved amongst his people because of his sublime character because of his kindness and his generosity because of his uh, haya a word which we usually translate as modesty maybe does that do it shame now we're going somewhere else it seems shine oh three words already just proves to you that the word haya cannot be translated with one word alone if anybody of you is doing translation or is writing in English write the word haya and then put all of these words in parentheses because haya is not only shyness and it's not only shame and it's not only modesty if you say it's only shyness you're gonna find out it's not correct because if you apply it in a different context you would say no that's not that's not the haya that we're talking about 
So it's a combination of all of those things. Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu an was known for this haya. A shyness, a sort of bashfulness, but not a bashfulness that would prevent him from upholding the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because bashfulness, the shortcoming of bashfulness, is that someone would be bashful concerning a shara, concerning a deen. But haya is not like that. Because haya from Allah prevents me from in any way uh, not giving Allah his rights and his dues. Not implementing some characteristics, some hukum, some, uh, some legal ruling of the deen. Haya will not prevent me. Khajal and bashfulness will. You see the difference? So haya is something different. And this is why it's better to translate it this way. Uthman ibn Affan had haya. A certain shyness from people. A shame that would prevent him from committing any sins. Not only in Islam, but even before Islam. Because he was known to avoid immoralities even in Jahiliyyah. Subhanallah. Uthman ibn Affan never worshipped or prostrated to an idol. He did not drink alcohol. He did not commit zina before Islam. In Jahiliyyah, brothers and sisters. Even though it was permitted. But many people did it. Many of the Sahaba as well. It was fine. It wasn't haram then. Right? And even the, the prohibition of alcohol in Islam came gradually as we know. Right? Some of the Sahaba were still drinking. But they were ordered not to uh, drink if they were going to pray. It was gradual. Uthman did not drink even before Islam in Jahiliyyah. Haya. It's almost like it's embedded in him. A sort of uh, a haya that gave him a reasonable attitude towards things. So he figured, how are these people worshipping idols besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Why would someone drink something that would affect their intellect, their faculty of reasoning? So it was a haya that, that, and an attitude, a very reasonable one, that gave him an understanding, a very reasonable understanding of things. So he was reasonable even before. And thus, it is not surprising that he was so similar to the Prophet ﷺ in attitude and character, and that he was loved amongst his people. To the extent that it was almost like an example. So if I wanted to say, I love you, I would say, I love you as much as Mecca loves Uthman. You see? This is how much he was loved. And we know the same about the Prophet ﷺ. And this is before the prophethood. Uthman ibn Affan was so, had such haya, and he was famous for this, to the extent that the Prophet ﷺ told us, that even the angels have a shyness from Uthman. The angels, Allahu Akbar, the purified ones who have not committed any sins, who do whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands them, they had a sort of shyness from Uthman ibn Affan. The best of humanity to walk on this earth, our beloved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa had a certain shyness from Uthman radiallahu Subhanallah. How? In the famous narration, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sitting and he was with his wife, with Aisha radiallahu anha. And he was sitting the way a person would sit while being at home, not necessarily fully dressed. 
So part of his leg was showing. So a man came and asked for permission to enter. It was Abu Bakr. So he allowed him to enter and the Prophet wasallam did not change his position in any way. Abu Bakr talked with the Prophet wasallam a little and then left. The next person to seek permission was Umar. Umar an entered, spoke to the Prophet wasallam and left. Again, the Prophet wasallam was in the same position. Uthman ibn Affan entered and sought permission to speak to the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ immediately put down his clothing or his robe, changed his position, and then spoke to Uthman. After he left, Aisha ﷺ was surprised. She said, Abu Bakr came in, you didn't change your position. Umar ﷺ entered. You didn't change your position or do anything different. Uthman ibn Affan came in and you pulled over your, your robe, you sat up. So he said to her, Oh Aisha, should I not be shy from the one that the angels are shy from? Allahu Akbar. The angels have a, a, a shyness, a bashfulness from Uthman ibn Affan. The Prophet ﷺ felt the same. And this speaks to the beautiful haya of Uthman and his character. And it also speaks to the beauty of the character of the Prophet ﷺ. Why? Why? Give me a chance to drink. Yes, brother. He? Respect. he? He respected the fact that is really shy. Okay, he respected the fact that he's shy, therefore. Had the Prophet ﷺ not done that, Uthman ibn Affan might have left. Uthman ibn Affan might not have entered. <laughs> Once seeing the Prophet ﷺ in that way, he might have uh, left and, and, and felt shy to enter. So the Prophet ﷺ was taking that into consideration. And we see this in other uh, situations where the Prophet ﷺ was dealing with some of the Sahaba. He always takes into consideration the situation of his friends, of his companions. He thinks about them. He puts them himself in their shoes. So immediately sat up. Otherwise, He's the Prophet ﷺ. He doesn't need to do anything. He doesn't need to change his position. He doesn't need to sit up. But he did it out of shyness from Uthman and respect for Uthman and taking into consideration this uh, attitude of Uthman. It also shows you the Prophet ﷺ was, a, was an expert on his companions. May Allah be pleased with them all. So Uthman ibn Affan was known for this haya. Uthman ibn Affan, my brothers and sisters, is related to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The grandmother of Uthman, Al-Bayda, known as Al-Bayda, is the paternal aunt of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So she is Ammat Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That makes the mother of Uthman what? Cousin. Very good. Bintu Ammatihi. And that makes Uthman radiallahu an his second cousin. Right? So his mother is the direct cousin of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he's a relative of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uthman ibn Affan was given a gift. And this gift was in business. He was a businessman. He had business acumen and prowess. He understood business. How to bring merchandise and sell it. 
he was an expert and therefore he became rich and he was able to amass a fortune even though after Islam he had to like do it all over again because he was so generous that a lot of the times he would be giving it away he would be helping the orphans if you want to know about Uthman ask the orphans of Mecca ask the needy and the poor of, of Mecca check with the slaves of Mecca in one narration Uthman used to say that every week I would emancipate a slave one of his slaves he would make him free for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his generosity subhanallah was uh, unsurpassed so he used to give in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then subhanallah he would make his money again and th in this way he made a fortune and he continued to make money by our standards my brothers and sisters Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu an is a millionaire and you might say if you get a uh, little bit precise and technical you might even say billionaire I didn't study his you know exact all his exact assets but for all practical purposes he's at least a millionaire and you might even say a billionaire okay compared to others subhanallah it's just it's like you know you know how the the, the man said about the Prophet Sallallahu that he just keeps on giving and giving without fearing poverty in any way this is the way Uthman ibn Affan was he would just give and give as if he never feared poverty and he never feared loss and it's almost like every time he would give Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would replenish uh, his account Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu an was one of the first to enter Islam some of the sources mention that he was one-fourth of Islam what does that mean a fraction of Islam how do we section or partition Islam what does it mean if he was one-fourth of Islam the fourth to accept Islam in other words all of Islam in the very beginning was two three four people the first to accept Islam was Abu Bakr Ali ibn Abi Talib now I'm going uh, to the next talk then after that hmm now it's someone else someone else became Muslim second definitely we know that for sure right Abu Bakr Khadija Ali was the first we mentioned another one Zayd ibn Haritha barakallahu feek and then possibly Uthman Uthman as some sources say was, was one fourth or one fifth of Islam one of the first to accept Islam however Wallahu a'lam uh, this seems to be a poss possibly a misunderstanding of the narration of Ibn Ishaq because Muhammad Ibn Ishaq Sahib al sirah is the one who mentioned this he mentioned the five that Abu Bakr brought to Islam <laughs> may Allah يعني, be pleased with Abu Bakr you already had Abu Bakr so now you can tell me the five that he brought to Islam quickly I'm losing time what is it? Az-Zubayr Talha Rahman ibn Awf who else? Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas and Uthman our personality today, our star Uthman ibn Affan is one of the good deeds of Abu Bakr as well as those others Subhanallah and they are all counted amongst the ten who were given the glad tidings of paradise all of them 
So five of them are through Abu Bakr. Radiallahu anhu arda. Uthman was one of them. And in the narration, it mentions that Abu Bakr came to Uthman. And he said, oh Uthman, you see these, uh, these idols that people are worshipping. Does it make any sense? How can people worship these idols that do not hear and do not see and so on? And Uthman, subhanallah, it immediately was in line with his fitrah. As you can see, Uthman ibn Affan was very close to his fitrah. Even without a shara, right? Even without having the message of Islam, he was already, for all practical purposes, you could say almost a practicing Muslim. So once Abu Bakr said this, it was a no-brainer. So he said, take me to the Prophet wasallam. He went to the Prophet, he heard from him. He said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. He is of his sabiqeen. So now if we take those first three or four we just mentioned, and the five of al-ashar al-mubashirin that Abu Bakr brought, these are the first eight. This is like a magic number. These were the first people, those first eight people. This was Islam. Okay? And then after that, people started coming in greater numbers. But it was still all da'wah in secret. Okay? But Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu an is one of those four, first uh, four people. And we need to remember that, especially in the second part, insha'Allah, when we start talking about the trials and tribulations that happened at the end of his life, which I'm sure uh, a lot of you know about. My brothers and sisters, the Prophet wasallam loved Uthman an so much that he married him his daughter, Ruqayya. And Uthman was after Ruqayya. So it's not just that the Prophet ﷺ offered her to him. Uthman was wanted to marry Ruqayya. And he was keen on having her. But she was married to the son of Abu Lahab. When the Prophet ﷺ announced himself as the Messenger of Allah, Abu Lahab wanted to spite the Prophet ﷺ, so he told him to divorce Ruqayya. Uthman was exhilarated. Perfect. So he went after her, and he married her. And it was a lovely marriage, and one that they used to use also as an example of, you know, uh, the... the uh, the loveliest couple, Uthman ibn Affan and uh, Ruqayya, the daughter of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Uthman radiallahu an was with her and migrated with her to Al-Habasha. Because Uthman ibn Affan being one of the first people to accept Islam was also one of those who was oppressed, persecuted and tortured in order to make them come back to Al-Kufr, in order to dissuade them from the, the path of guidance, the path of light. So he was persecuted so much along with the others, so he was one of the first people to migrate to Abyssinia, to Al-Habasha. And the migration, my brothers and sisters, do not look at it as fleeing from the situation that they were in. This was actually something of a noble act. Because when, when those people migrated, they were migrating for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hijra fi sabilillah. And when you migrate, you're leaving the people you love. Remember what we just said. He was loved amongst these people. Imagine someone, you know, they didn't have YouTube then or Facebook for that matter. So, you know, if a star, if there's a star in Malaysia, if he moves to, you know, uh, Singapore, he'll still be a star, right? Because of his YouTube followers. They didn't have that then. 
if they left the area, if he left the country, he's essentially going somewhere where he is completely unknown. He's leaving this uh, environment where he built his reputation, where people loved him, where he can do his business, and so on and so forth. So he's leaving everything behind for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this was actually something, this is one of the things that we mention about Uthman in order to praise him, that he migrated to Al-Habasha. And later on, of course, migrated to al Madina. So he migrated both migrations. And he migrated both migrations with his wife, Ruqayya. Ruqayya was with him all the way up until just after the migration. After they migrated to al Madina. In the second year of Al-Hijrah, there was a seminal battle that took place, and that is the battle of Badr, Al-Furqan, the one that separated between Al-Haq wa Al-Batil, truth and falsehood, was named the criterion. The battle of during the or just up to the time of the battle of Badr, Ruqayya radiallahu anha was sick. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam asked Uthman to stay with her. Stay back with Ruqayya and take care of her. So Uthman radiallahu an did not witness the battle of Badr. Clear? But it was upon the order of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Furthermore, out of Allah's generosity and the character of the Prophet wasallam, he said, you will have the reward of someone who fought in Badr and a portion of the booty as well. So the Prophet wasallam, in so doing, considered Uthman to be one of those who attended the battle of Badr. And that itself is one of the most important accolades in Islamic history. When you say someone is Badri, they have attended, they witnessed the battle of Badr. So Uthman ibn Affan, even though he did not attend by the order of the Prophet he got the reward of someone who did and he also got a fraction of the Ghanima. Unfortunately, however, right after the battle of Badr, Ruqayya radiallahu anha died. And the Prophet ﷺ came back from Badr and he was very saddened, obviously. And so was Uthman ibn Affan. And in our age and with our ideas and concepts, we might say to ourselves, you know, I, I, I left him behind to take care of her and still, you know, he, he, maybe he didn't take care of her enough. That's why she died. Maybe he didn't give her medicine. Maybe he, he neglected her. All kinds of things might have ran through our minds by today's thinking, right? Today's standards. But not the Prophet ﷺ. Not only did he not say anything like that or think anything like that, but quite the opposite. He actually said and he uh, showed interest in marrying his next daughter to Uthman ibn Affan. And this is Umm Kulthum. And indeed, he married him to Umm Kulthum radiallahu anha. And Umm Kulthum also stayed with Uthman ibn Affan for a while. And later on, Umm Kulthum as well died. Subhanallah. Now, definitely there must be something. Right? There's something about this guy. This is the second daughter that dies, you know, while under his custody, while being his wife. Definitely, I have to talk to him, I have to chastise him, I have to find out why. What's going on, Uthman? 
Are you not doing something properly? No, none of that. The Prophet ﷺ said, Wallahi Uthman, if I had a third to give to you, I would marry her to you as well. Look at the love of the Prophet ﷺ and his admiration and respect for Uthman. And also, the, it shows the, the false nature of the ideas that we have nowadays with regards to such things. Where we might think to ourselves, you know, and the shaitan starts playing with our mind. Not the Prophet ﷺ. Quite the opposite. He says, if I had a third, I would give her to you. And Uthman ibn Affan had other wives as well. They were not the only ones. Okay, he married other wives as well. So he could have even said, my daughters, <laughs> what about the others, right? But subhanallah, this is not the way they used to think and they know that this is the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My brothers and sisters, Uthman ibn Affan is one of the noble scribes of the Quran. Never forget that. Before the compilation, we'll get to that, or maybe we won't, considering the timekeeper. Um, but he was one of the scribes. He was one of the ones who was writing the Quran. Right? He was one of the ones that the Prophet ﷺ entrusted to writing the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, if any of you have a sanad or an ijazah in the Quran where you have recited to a shaykh or a scholar and that scholar recited to a scholar in an uninterrupted chain all the way up to the Prophet ﷺ, you will see Uthman in your sanad. How many have, of you have seen that in your sanad? And that way we'll also know how many huffad we have that have ijazah. Nobody's gonna raise their hand. If you inspect your ijazah, you will find Uthman, you will find Ali, you will find Ubay ibn Ka'b, all of these great Sahaba in the Sanad. This is Uthman ibn Affan, one of the earliest to accept Islam and one of the scribes who wrote down the Quran. And later on, if we get to it, inshallah, the compilation of the Quran as well. In fact, let's mention it now before I forget or before we lose time. Uthman ibn Affan, my brothers and sisters, is the one who is responsible for the second compilation, collection that happened of the Quran. The first one was Abu Bakr radiallahu an. What Abu Bakr radiallahu an did, and these are two necessary steps for the preservation of the Quran. And I have a series on that, that is a, like a, a, a full day seminar on how the Quran was compiled. So I, I can't get into all the details here, but suffice to say that Abu Bakr radiallahu an, excuse me, brought together the different fragments that were all over al Madina, which had Quran inscribed on it. So the Quran was written and have no doubt that every word of the Quran was written from the mouth of the Prophet ﷺ. But it was in different places, on fragments. They didn't have paper then, okay? So they wrote it on some smooth stones, bones, leaves, what have you, parchment. So Abu Bakr's goal and task was to bring together all of these fragments in order to bring everything that was written of the Quran together. All right? The task of Uthman was a little bit different. When Hudayfa tells Uthman ibn Affan, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, O commander of the believers, save this Ummah before they go the same route of the Jews and the Christians, whereby they will differ amongst themselves or about their holy book. So Hudayfa, having gone to the different lands, saw that people were reciting some of the different recitations. We know that the Quran came down 
in seven different ahruf. I don't have time to go into all of that. I'm, I'm sorry, and that's quite uh, a long explanation. But let's just say that there are seven different ways of reciting the Quran, seven bona fide, genuine ways of reciting the Quran that Jibreel brought to Muhammad. Hudayfa is hearing these different recitations. And some of these people may have accepted Islam fairly recently and some of them may not have the fundamentals that others do and he started hearing things like my recitation is better than yours and this is where he flipped so he said ya amir al mu'minin save this ummah so the task of uthman radiyallahu an was to unite the ummah on one quran so this is, this is the task that he gave to those noble Sahaba coming together, bring it all, collect it, and put it all in one mushaf between two covers and burn everything else. And this is the mushaf that we have today, what we call Al Mushaf Al Uthman. This is attributed to Uthman. This is one of the greatest tasks and achievements of Uthman ibn Affan radiyallahu an. After the death of Umar radiyallahu an, they told him, Ya Amir al-Muminin, appoint a Khalifa. So, Umar, ibn, uh, Umar radiallahu an said, I see no better solution than to make it shura between six of the people that the Prophet sallallahu was pleased with when he died. So, he made it between six candidates. He gave it to six candidates and he made it shura between them. And those six are Ali, Uthman, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, Zubayr ibn Awwad, Talha ibn Ubaidullah, Barakallah Feek. These six, right? Again, Al Mubashari bil Jannah, the Prophet is pleased with them, absolutely. So he made a shura between these six. So, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf says, Okay, you want to appoint the Khalifa in three minutes? He wants to appoint the Khalifa in three minutes. Subhanallah, Allahu Akbar. And he wants consensus from the audience. So Abdul Rahman ibn Awf says to them, let's make it amongst three. Let three of us uh, abdicate, surrender our candidacy to someone else. So as Zubair ibn Awam says, I give it to Ali. Talha says, I give it to Uthman. And Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas says, I give it to Abdurrahman ibn Awf. So now we're down to three. These are not people uh, looking for positions and wealth and uh, YouTube followers or Twitter and Facebook followers, brothers and sisters, with one word for Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, Sa'ad ibn Abu Waqqas says, go, Talha, Zubair, they are better than me, they are more deserving than I am. These are the Sahaba, these are Mubashareen bil Jannah, what do you think? They're after, besides, what is the Khilafah, riches? They looked at it as the ultimate responsibility, something they're going to be asked about on the Day of Judgment, Khilafah to Rasulullah. So now it's between Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, Uthman ibn Affan, and Ali ibn Abi Talib. So Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, he was a diplomat. He, say, he tells Ali and Uthman, Would you be content if you left me to choose between you? And they agreed. So then Abdul Rahman tells Uthman, you know Ali ibn Abi Talib, who he is, and he is the, the cousin of the, the Prophet and so on and so forth. If I choose him, 
will you accept and will you obey? He said, absolutely. Then he went to Ali. He said, you know who Uthman is. And he was one of the first to accept Islam and so on and so forth. And you know how much the Prophet ﷺ loved him. If I choose him, will you obey and accept his Khilafah? He said, of course. And then Abdurrahman ibn Auf goes for three sleepless days. Doing what? Having an election. And now people are going to jump on me. They didn't have elections then and this and that. And we don't believe in democracy. And for all practical purposes, he went and did an election. How? They didn't have cards, but he just took their opinion. Who would you uh, appoint? Who would you choose? Uthman or Ali? He got their opinion, regardless of whether someone filled out a ballot card and put it in a box or, or anything of that sort. Time's up. Khalifa, but the Khalifa is not here yet. Give me a minute. Um, so he went and he started getting, quote unquote, the votes, the opinions. That's what it is. Okay? To the extent he even consulted women in their homes. Can you imagine? Going and knocking on the door. Hello, uh, Mrs. So-and-so. I, I have something to ask you about. It's an election. Right? But he's doing it all on his own. And it's probably perfectly understandable if he had helpers. And they were going around Medina. Three sleepless nights, he says. And he's going around and asking everyone that he can ask. And getting the opinions. Some are choosing Uthman and some are choosing Ali. But isn't it enough? Why doesn't Abdurrahman just choose? No, this is Shura. When we talk about modern, and I don't want to go on a tangent that will take me for another hour or two, but modern day political discourse, when we talk about taking the opinion of the people, this is ultimately Islamic, my brothers and sisters. This is an Islamic concept. If anything, it may have been taken from our Islam as well, yet we do not understand its importance. The people have to be consulted. So he is consulting the people, he's getting their opinion. Otherwise, Uthman and Ali, which side of the Jannah do you want? Do you want the, the, the right side of Jannah or the left side of Jannah? I mean, who cares? They, they're they're, they're, they're you know, the best to, to walk on the earth at the time. But no, we have to get the opinion of the Ummah. The Ummah has to have a say. So after doing this uh, long process of getting the opinions of the people, he said, I discovered that the people will not accept anyone but Uthman. He said it to Ali radiallahu an, and he took Uthman's hand radiallahu an, and he gave him the pledge and everyone there gave the pledge including Ali radiallahu an. okay in fact he was one of the first to accept and give the pledge to Uthman radiallahu an. listen to no other uh, gibberish garbage baloney about Ali you know not being happy about it and so on he is the first to accept and to give the pledge to Uthman radiallahu an and furthermore everyone accepted the bay'ah of Uthman to the extent that Imam Ahmad said that no bay'ah, no pledge no choosing of Khalifa uh, involved more consensus than the bay'ah of Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu an and I'll stop here since we have the Khalifa uh, we're taking a break brother go ahead barakallahu feekum بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. I praise Allah Almighty and I send praise and blessings upon Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. I think I should have done this in the first place, but oh well. Um, some people coming to this talk may have expected the majority of it to be about the fitna. Maybe some people were disappointed. 
But I didn't want to fall into the sinister trap of making the history of this great man, the history of fitna by some of the fasaqa and mubtadi'a and munafiqeen. And when we make the history of this man, the history of the objections of those criminals, you are insulting Uthman radiallahu anh. And you are not showing respect for the history and the achievements of this paragon of excellence, Uthman ibn Affan. Therefore, please, my brothers and sisters, do not make the history of this man the fitna, the trials, the tribulations. And by the way, this has a lot of modern applications as well. And if we had more time, I might discuss it with you. Where one thing, something very important, eventually becomes known as a fraction that has corrupted the matter entirely. And honestly, the fitna itself needs a whole talk or talks. If we really want to get into the nitty gritty and the details, okay? But the history of this man is not what happened at the end of his life and at the end of his khilafah. It's not about how Uthman died. It's about how Uthman lived. Radiallahu anhu. That's where we need to take the lessons. Okay? The unparalleled generosity of Uthman, the way he made use of the money that Allah gave him, is a lesson that we can talk about and we can learn from this journey until the end of our lives in fact to try to become a Uthman in terms of charity is a journey of a lifetime because Uthman for all practical purposes uh, left everyone behind is a very difficult act to follow because whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him, he just gave it fi sabilillah. When he first entered Medina, radiallahu an, the muhajireen immediately realized that there was a scarcity of water. There's a water shortage. There's a problem. Resources. What are we going to do? We just migrated. We just left everything. We left our towns, our beloved ones, our relatives and friends and families. If this is not livable, what can we do? There was one well. And that well was the only one that could save them from this water shortage problem. And the only well with waters, with quality of water, good enough to be potable. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Who will buy this well? And I promise him paradise. And the well is called Bi'ir Roma. Right? Why should it be bought? Because it was ownership of someone else. In one narration, a Jew owned it. And... Uh, he used to uh, charge a little bit too much for anybody who wanted to take water. So the Prophet ﷺ is saying, who will buy it and I guarantee in paradise. So who sought after it? Uthman ibn Affan. He went and he bought it. In one narration about the, the Jew, the Jew refused to sell it. So he bought half of it. And after buying half, the Jew figured, okay, I'll just, you know, I can get half of the, the... He sold it, 
okay, for a certain price, and then he'll get profit from the, the other half. How is it half and half? Well, it's one day for Uthman and one day for the Jew. So, what ended up happening is that on the day of Uthman, Uthman made it a waqf. Anybody who wants to drink comes and drinks for free. So the Muslims will all come, take their need of water on the day of Uthman, and on the day of the Jew, nobody comes. He lost all his customers. Because Uthman made it waqf. And I apologize again for my voice. So sad. Um, so the Jew figured this is a, a losing uh, proposition. So he, he just chose to sell the rest of it. Khalas, he gave it to Uthman. Uthman it made it waqf. Uthman bought Al Jannah through Bi'ar Roma. How many of us have that on our resume? This is what we need to be talking about. It's not only about the history of the fitna. Okay, what happened at the end of his life. Who is able to do something like this? This is a man who understood the value of money. And unfortunately, a lot of Muslims do not understand the value of money. A lot of Muslims think that it is zuhd. It's part of the Muslim ascetic attitude to walk around humbly, put my head to the ground. Yes, yes, Sheikh. You know, and uh, wear some really old clothes to show that I am Zahid, you know, and I don't have money because I don't care about this dunya and all I care about is the hereafter. Baloney! This is baloney. This is not the way Muslims were. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves a strong Muslim. And today, strength is through wealth and money. If you have money, you can do all kinds of things for the Muslims. And Uthman, at his time, is proof of that. Imagine if he was in our time. Wallahi, Uthman would have projects all over the world. But we are still talking about, is it better to be poor or is it better to have money? Come on. We're not talking about the situation where a person is maftoon. There's a fitna of wealth. That's not what I'm talking about here. If a person knows himself that if he were to amass wealth, that that wealth would distance him from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about regular people who are able to have money and want to use that money for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why the Prophet ﷺ said, Ni'mal malu salih lil abdi salih. How beautiful and great is good wealth for a good person. If Uthman did not buy Bi Roma, the Muslims would have been in a very difficult position. So do we just wait for everyone to be their own Uthman? We need strength, brothers and sisters. We need it. And we need that strength and we need to put it in the service of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what Uthman radiallahu an proved. And we can go on and on because, I mean, this was the, the, the way of Uthman uh, radiallahu an. Whatever he had, he gave for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you have a lot of wealth and you find that it is causing you to become too attached to the dunya, that's your own jihad. That is your own jihad and strive. Striving towards not making that wealth distance you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But does that mean that you, you, you live your life as a poor man? A zahid does not, or zuhud, does not necessitate poverty. Uthman was a zahid. Was Uthman not a zahid? How can a billionaire be a zahid? Absolutely. Because his wealth is not in his heart. It's in his hand. 
He gives it wherever it's needed. The Prophet ﷺ says, Who will donate? Uthman is there. Who will buy Bir Roma? Uthman is there. Jaysh al Usra, Uthman is there. Uthman has several of those accolades that we could only wish for. It's not surprising, therefore, that Uthman radiallahu an, after becoming Khalifa, not only was he, did he have barakah and wealth, the wealth and barakah was for the whole ummah. So actually the time of Uthman was a time of profound wealth. They didn't know what to do with it. Al-Hasan al-Basri who lived at the time of Uthman used to go out and call people, come and take <laughs> your share. Come and take your share of the wealth, of the money, of the fruits. There was so much wealth that on a daily basis, they were going and calling people to come and take their share. Subhanallah. Even though there's so much money today, it seems like it's only in the hands of a few. At the time of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu an, that wealth was for the ummah. The ummah benefited from that wealth and enjoyed it. And that's why the time of Uthman radiallahu an, and this is what we don't hear about a lot because the, the headline of the time of Uthman is the fitna. What about the the justice that he administered, the prosperity and stability that he gave to the Muslims, the conquests, my brothers and sisters, that he continued from the time of Umar And that reminds me, I wanted to comment on, on Kahoot. Some of those were trick questions. Some of them could have been another answer, so maybe we can change the result or something. Um, such as, when did Persia fall and, and uh, the Byzantine Empire, right? As we will see, the final fall of Persia was during the time of Uthman. Now someone's gonna say, I'm number one. Uh, but I mean, the, 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 what is popularly known is that most of the, those conquests happened at the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an, absolutely. But, what ended up happening is that a lot of these places that were conquered later on rebelled. And now there was instability once again. Okay? Especially in Persia. Alright? And even in uh, Egypt, in Africa. So some of these locations now rebelled again. So it was the duty of Uthman ibn Affan to preserve what Umar ibn al-Khattab had achieved and preserve he did and in the best way. So he continued the jihad against the Persian Empire. He continued the conquests in the area of Asham. Afriqiya, but Uthman ibn Affan was able then to extend the conquest beyond those confines. So he went even further into Central Asia. Yes, they started going into Central Asia in the time of Umar ibn Khattab. They went to Azerbaijan, but Azerbaijan was unstable. So Uthman is the one who had to uh, stabilize things over there. Similarly, Uthman ibn Affan is the one who conquered Armenia. That was the achievement of Uthman alone. Uthman had to make sure that the area of Egypt was stable, especially in the west. And then further into East Libya. And he got as far as Tunisia. This was the achievement of Uthman. Uthman radiallahu an expanded the Islamic Empire through the jihad. All the while calling people 
to Islam, spreading the justice of Islam, spreading the tawheed of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are things we don't hear about during the time of Uthman. Radiallahu anhu. Furthermore, he was the first one to develop a naval fleet. So now Uthman ibn Affan was the one to develop a naval fleet and to develop marine defenses for the Muslim Ummah. Something that didn't exist at the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab. Because Umar al-Khattab was afraid of the, the sea and the ocean. Because he feared for the lives of the Muslims. This was the achievement of Uthman. The most famous watershed battle, literally watershed battle, that is Sawari, also known as Battle of the Masts. This was under the suzerainty of Uthman ibn Affan. This great battle, the first marine battle for the Muslims against the most experienced Romans in their own sea, brothers and sisters, in their own sea. The sea that they were fighting in belonged to their enemy. It was called Bahr al-Rum, the Sea of the Romans. And they were the ones who were experienced in marine warfare. The first marine battle, in this watershed battle, the Muslims were the victors, subhanAllah. This was under the rule of Sayyidina Uthman, radiallahu this famous battle, it was under him. Through his guidance, through his approval, through his governance, the people he was choosing to have those responsibilities, okay? This battle was so important that it basically gave the message to the, the Roman Empire that the Muslims are no longer outside the marine equation anymore. And this is why they were able to go and take over the island of Cyprus. This was under Uthman ibn Affan. But we don't hear about this much because we are uh, focusing on something else. Taib. Let's come to the fitna. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always uh, abolish any fitna. Of course, these conquests would have continued had it not been for what happened to Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan. As you saw in Kahoot, his, uh, his reign was for 12 years, after Umar al-Khattab, who was Khalifa for 10 years. Now, during his reign, there were some criticisms of him. And before we get into the criticisms, let us try to understand why there were criticisms. Were they justified? We will see later on. But first of all, why were there criticisms against him? One of them was precisely the prosperity that Uthman ibn Affan was able to provide by the blessing and help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That prosperity, okay, uh, makes people attached to the dunya, makes people want more of the dunya, start demanding more, looking for more. And as we know, as time goes on, the deen, the level of piety and religiosity is decreasing, right? So people fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala less. They're not like the, the people at the time of Abu Bakr and Umar. Like in the famous saying of uh, Ali when he was asked, you know, uh, when he was asked, why are all of these trials and tribulations happen happening during your time? and not during the time of Abu Bakr and Umar. So Ali said, because Abu Bakr and Umar had, were rulers over people like me, and I am a ruler over someone like you. <laughs> right? So uh, this is the situation, okay? Things are uh, going backwards. So there was prosperity. There was wealth. And Uthman ibn Affan was a soft-natured man. 
We talked about Uthman in Mecca. Now we have Uthman in Medina, the Khalifa. He was always liked. He was always able to make friends, right? To please people. He was loved. But now as a Khalifa, necessarily there may be people who will be against him. Okay? Or some people simply do not deserve the amicability and the soft, -natured, soft nature of Sayyidina Uthman. So these two factors and possibly others are what uh, encouraged some who may have had problems with Uthman already from before to start criticizing him. This doesn't mean that all of their criticisms are completely unjustified. Okay? But as we will see, that it was very far from the way that they were portraying it. Of course, uh, one of the, uh, or some of the criticisms were, I'll mention three that was mentioned by one man alone. And this is something that was going around. Al-Bukhari mentions that a pilgrim was coming to Hajj from Egypt. So he sees some people sitting around. And he asks, who are they? They, they said they are from Quraysh. He said, who is the Shaykh? They said, Abdullah ibn Umar. So he came to him. And he said, oh Abdullah, I want to ask you about Uthman. Is it true that he fled on the day of Uhud? He said, yes. He said, is it true that he did not witness the battle of Badr? He said, yes. He said, five minutes, brother, what are you talking about? Allahu Akbar. <laughs> okay, you want five minutes only? That's fine. But how are we going to get all the way to the end in five minutes? Um, he said, yes, he did not witness the battle of Badr. He said, what about the, the Radwan pledge, Bay'at al-Radwan, that happened in the sixth year Hijri under the tree in Hudaybiyah? Did he witness it? No. Subhanallah. He said, okay, that means all the criticisms are correct. So he said, come here, let me explain it to you. Number one, fleeing from Uhud, I bear witness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forgiven him and forgiven the people of Uhud as is mentioned in the Quran. Number two, he did not witness the battle of Badr because the Prophet ﷺ himself told him to stay back with his wife Ruqayya to take care of her. Furthermore, he gave him his, a reward of one of the warriors of Badr and also apportioned part of the booty for him. Thirdly, the Radwan pledge happened because of Uthman. Because when they were there, the Prophet ﷺ wanted to enter Mecca to do the Umrah. But the, the, uh, he sent Uthman as an ambassador to them, knowing his influence and his reputation amongst them. So he sent them as an ambassador to Quraysh. And when, uh, after he, he went and they told him, we will not allow the rest of the Muslims, but we will allow you to do your tawaf and your umrah. So he said, how can I presume to do this without the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? And they were how many people, the Muslims at the time? In Bay'at al-Radwan? That should have been one of them. Yes, brothers, sisters? Between 14 and 1500 Muslims, okay, waiting to enter to do the Umrah. But because Uthman didn't come back for a while, then a rumor came that Uthman ibn Affan was killed. The ambassador of the Prophet was killed. So this is where the Prophet took the bay'ah from the companions. What was the bay'ah? To die for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, straight. Ala al mawt bay'a ala al mawt So they all pledged 
14 to 1500 Muslims. And this is the, the bay'ah about which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, revealed the, the Quran, saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with them. Those who pledge to the Prophet sallam under the tree. This is called bay'at al-radwan. In the other ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that in this pledge, the bay'at al-radwan, or before that rather, when the Prophet sallam took the bay'ah, they all uh, uh, put their hands. The Prophet sallallahu put his hand and with his right hand said, and this is the hand of Uthman. So he used his own blessed holy hand to represent the hand of Uthman. And we know that the hand of the Prophet ﷺ is better than the hand of Uthman. So not only did Uthman pledge, he pledged through the hand of the, the Prophet ﷺ. And as the ayah says, يَدُ اللَّهِ فَوْقَ أَيْدِيهِمْ The hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above theirs. What kind of a blessed pledge is this? Allah is pleased with them. And Uthman, of course, is one of them. And the pledge was taken in order to defend the, the blood of Uthman. So how can someone say, why wasn't he there in Bayat? Ar-Rudwan, it's totally nonsensical. So he told him that he was, uh, that uh, the Prophet ﷺ had mentioned him. Okay, so I can't mention most of the, um, uh, the, uh, the issues. Let me try to summarize. How much are you going to give me, brother? Do you want to continue with the question? Do you know? the, the question is, um, from the questions you got, are there a lot of questions or not? Not a lot of questions. Three or four, just three. Okay, so we can... Uh, compress the Q&A yeah, yeah. and, and, and have a little bit more time. Tayyip, you can stop me maybe 10 minutes before you want to adjourn or something like that. But I'll, 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 I'll try to summarize uh, quickly. Okay. Uh, one of the main things that they criticized about Uthman radiallahu an is giving positions to some of his relatives. And again, this is a little bit hypocritical and uh, illogical because all of the Khulafa used some of their relatives. All. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali. And using your relatives if they deserve the position is not blameworthy in any way. It's not quote-unquote nepotism okay to to use a modern definition and besides this is 1400 years ago and until now people you know give all kinds of positions to their relatives right and they get rich somehow subhanallah through these positions right and yet they are criticizing Uthman 1400 years ago when this was, you know, when this was not really an issue. Slaves were bought and sold, my brothers and sisters. So he, so what? You know, he put some of his relatives in some positions. And by the way, they were all very much worthy of those positions. Muawiyah, radiallahu anhu. You have a problem with Muawiyah? Muawiyah was put in his position by Umar, not Uthman. Uthman just continued it. And, and Muawiyah radiallahu anh, needs a, a, a lecture on his own. Listen up, revivers. <laughs> right? Muawiyah uh, uh, radiallahu an was one of the most just rulers. There are some criticisms, yes. Okay, especially politically. But he was one of the most just rulers. So Muawiyah was appointed by Umar. Uthman just continued it. What's the big deal? And by the way, Muawiyah is one of the most capable rulers. And this is why he was ruling for so long. Radiallahu anhu. Okay? Another man, Abdullah ibn Amir ibn Qurayz, 
Okay, he was uh, a relative of uh, Uthman. This man lived his life in jihad. And he was one of the people who conquered all of these places. When we talked about Central Asia, I forgot to mention, they went beyond the, the, the river, the Oxus River. They went into Trans, Transoxiana, or Transoxania, whichever you prefer. Okay? They went deep into Central Asia, into Uzbekistan, beyond Afghanistan and Iran. This is, this is where somebody like Abdullah ibn Amr was, was showing his worth. So what? If he was a relative, if he deserves it, what's the big deal? And by the way, this is a man who the Prophet ﷺ himself blessed. Because when he was a, a, a very a young child, the saliva of the Prophet ﷺ fell into his mouth. And he started absorbing it and taking it in. So the Prophet ﷺ said, I hope that insha'Allah, he will be blessed in terms of suqya, in terms of abundance of water. Indeed, wherever this man went, subhanAllah, it's as if whatever shortage of water disappeared. So what if he used Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Quraysh? Or even Marwan ibn al-Hakam. Okay, Marwan ibn al-Hakam is not one of the sabiqeen uh, uh, or one of the, the khulafa. But he was also someone who was very capable. And a few others. But out of all of these important co co positions, ministries, governorships, they were very few. If you take them all together, you might find that they are 25%, one-fourth. So if he had five of his relatives, there were 15 others who weren't. What's the big deal? But this is the, 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 the hypocrites, the quote-unquote khawarij, who like to magnify any mistake, any sin, in order to criticize and to devalue a person. So one by, so this is how they started to create this environment. And we said Uthman ibn Affan was soft-natured. Okay? He didn't want to deal with these people in harsh ways. All right? He wanted to debate with them. He wanted to talk. He wanted to show them that they were wrong. Up until the, the time of his death, he was still debating with them and trying to convince them and uh, persuade them. Okay? Who were these people? Very frequently they are described as khawarij. Okay? Even though, to be technical, we might say that the khawarij as a movement did not start until the time of Ali. But many scholars, uh, noteworthy scholars and luminaries, called them khawarij. Okay? Uh, because they had the, the, the same quality of the Khawarij. All right? Who are these people exactly? Well, they were uh, mainly in Iraq, in Basra and Kufa. They were in Egypt. And they started talking about Uthman ibn Affan. And they started magnifying some of these things that they considered mistakes or criticisms. One after another. And, of course... Uh, someone, there's always someone to uh, breathe into the fire, okay? And this is the, the evil personality of Abdullah ibn Sabah, okay? And Abdullah ibn Sabah is a Jew of Yemeni origin, all right? And this guy just spread his evil everywhere. Spread his evil in terms of aqidah spread his evil and his bid'ah in terms of politics, talked about uh, Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu, breathed fire into this, this atmosphere that started to arise, whereby people were uh, essentially fabricate, even fabricating things about Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu anhu. 
And a lot of these people, by the way, were not known for their knowledge or for their piety or for anything else. And they started criticizing Uthman left and right. And Uthman is doing this and Uthman is doing that. Uthman didn't attend uh, the, the, you know, uh, a child would be able to answer why Uthman ibn Affan was not in the battle of Badr or was not at Bay'at al rudwan So the timekeeper is pressuring me. Ultimately, the, these khawarij um, were exhorted by Muawiyah, by Abdurrahman ibn Khalid ibn al-Walid. They were exhorted even by the people in Medina. Ali uh, ibn Abi Talib, Talha al zubair They used to talk to these people. What are you doing? This is unacceptable. Okay, and they started trying to persuade them as much as possible. Some of them would uh, uh, pretend to have repented and then they just go back to doing the same old thing. Al uh, 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 Ali ibn Abi Talib, every, all of the Sahaba were ready to defend Uthman with their own lives including Ali ibn Abi Talib and Talha and Zubair and Aisha. Now the Munafiqeen and those who wanted to see this play out, they started fabricating letters written by these great Sahaba. So some may defend the Khawarij based on that. Because when they came to Medina finally and they started coming in droves, and, and accumulating in Al-Medina, they said, you sent us letters saying, come and take care of Uthman. Letters written in the name of Aisha, Ali, Talha, Zubair, A'udhu Billah. All fabrications. Immediately, the, the, the Sahaba exonerated themselves uh, of such letters. Uthman ibn Affan, uh, continued to try to persuade them. Eventually, they laid siege to his house. Okay, the siege lasted for between a month to forty days. And uh, when they laid siege to his house, it's literally a siege. Uthman ibn Affan could not uh, uh, leave his house anymore. Some of the great Sahaba immediately went and stayed with him under siege. And they numbered around 700. But the Kharijites outside were many multiples. They were between two to 3,000. And all the time, the Sahaba were telling Uthman ibn Affan, just give us the command. We are ready. We're going to take them. Al-Qadi Abu Bakr ibn al-Arabi al-Maliki, the famous scholar, he mentions that Zayd ibn Thabit tells the, the uh, Uthman ibn Affan, O oh, Uthman, the Ansar are just waiting for your command. The Ansar want to become the Ansar for the second time. In other words, they were the Ansar, the supporters of the Prophet ﷺ, and now they want to be your Ansar. Just give your command. Uthman didn't want that. So Uthman ibn Affan figured if he uh, brings some armies from Asham and from uh, uh, Egypt and from uh, these different places that maybe eventually he'll be able to stop any bloodshed when they see that there are armies approaching. These hypocrites, these criminals, when they learned that armies are approaching, they figured we have to do something now. So they started to attack. But Uthman ibn Affan the whole time was telling the Sahaba, if you still obey me as your Khalifa, I am telling you, do not fight for me. But the Sahaba couldn't believe it. When the criminals started attacking, the Sahaba started fighting, and some of them got injured, including Abdullah ibn Zubair. Al-Hasan wal Hussein themselves, the sons of Ali radiallahu anhu were defending Uthman. Al-Hasan ibn Ali was injured. And a narration mentions that he had to be carried out because of his injury. 
Subhanallah. But Uthman wanted none of it. He wanted no bloodshed. What gave Uthman this strength? Uthman ibn Affan was a Quranic person. He lived with the Quran. Some narrations mentioned that he would recite the whole Quran in a night or in a rak'ah. Allahu A'lam. But he, we know for all practical purposes, he lived his life with the Quran. And he was reciting Quran up until the last minute. He lived his life with the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ told him, this is going to happen to you. And he remembered it. When the Prophet ﷺ uh, uh, gave permission to Abu Bakr and Umar to enter and gave them the glad tiding of paradise. And then he gave the glad tiding of paradise to Uthman with one caveat that there will be a tribulation that you will face. So Uthman remembered this. And Uthman remembered that the Prophet ﷺ told him that if you are faced with a situation and you are asked to remove and the narration mentions your shirt. And what he meant by shirt here is the shirt of Khilafah. He said, if you are demanded to do so, do not agree to do, to, to do that. In other words, do not uh, break down and do not to, uh, succumb or capitulate to their demands. So Uthman ibn Affan remembered this and it, it calmed him down. And he knew for all practical purposes that he was going to be a shaheed. But the Sahaba did not. And the Sahaba never thought that it would come to killing the man. They thought it would just be the criticisms and so on and so forth. And they were basically saying, abdicate the Khilafah or give us Marwan ibn al-Hakam. Abu Bakr ibn al-Arabi says, if he had given Marwan ibn al-Hakam, he would have been a wrongdoer. He should not. They have no right to demand Marwan ibn al-Hakam. So Uthman ibn Affan stayed as Khalifa, did not capitulate to their demands until the last day. But he would, subhanAllah, when he was exhorting them, he went up to the second level and he started talking to them. He said, do you not bear witness that the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever buys the, the well of Roma will be given paradise? They said, yes. Subhanallah. They testified. He said, and I bought Bi'ir Roma. He said, do you not bear witness that the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever supports and funds the army of Al-Usra and Tabuk, that they will have Jannah? They said yes. And we know that Uthman ibn Affan is the one who funded this army completely. I know time is over, brothers. Just give me two minutes. I'm concluding. He funded it to the extent that the Prophet ﷺ said, ما ضر Uthman ما فعل بعد اليوم. Uthman cannot do anything wrong after this. They said yes. They testified. He's a man of Jannah. In all ways. But subhanallah, لِيَقْضِيَ اللَّهُ أَمْرًا كَانَ مَفْعُولًا Eventually, the Sahaba abided by uh, Uthman's commands. They, uh, they didn't defend the way they wanted to defend him. Eventually, they, they, they broke in. And Uthman radiallahu an, was reciting the Qur'an as usual. And uh, one of them, possibly Saudan ibn Hamran or someone else, possibly even Abdullah ibn Saba, entered and started stabbing him. And one narration mentions that as Uthman was defending himself, his hand got chopped off. And his wife was defending him. And three of her fingers got chopped off. Allahu Akbar. Uthman ibn Affan. And they kept on stabbing him until they killed him. And a drop of his blood fell on the verse in Surah Al-Baqarah where he was reciting the verse that said, فَسَيَكْفِيكَهُمُ اللَّهُ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ 
Allah will suffice you against them. And he is the all hearing and, all, and the all knowing. In this way, Uthman ibn Affan was martyred. And he knew he was going to be a shaheed. Because the Prophet, because the day, the night before he, he died, he saw a dream where the Prophet ﷺ was telling him, O oh Uthman, you are going to break fast with us. Allahu Akbar. You're going to break fast with us. So Uthman ibn Affan, radiallahu an, died on a Friday. And that itself is such an honor. And he was fasting and he was reciting the Quran. And he went to his Lord and there he met the Prophet ﷺ and uh, Abu Bakr and, and Umar. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be pleased with Uthman radiallahu an, and to be pleased with those who are pleased with, with Uthman. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to curse those who curse Uthman radiallahu an. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us to walk in the footsteps of this great man. Barakallahu feekum. I apologize for going beyond the time limit. Jazakumullah khairan. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Alright, let's move on to the question and answer session. Um, uh, first question. Sheikh, you said Ali was the first. I always heard that Khadija was the first. And Waraka bin Nawfal acknowledged the prophethood. Why is he not considered the first Muslim? Jazakallahu khairan. Uh, yes, Khadija was the first lady. And Ali ibn Abi Talib was the first uh, male. Barakallahu khairan. Waraka ibn Nawfal is considered, Wallahu a'lam, a Muslim. Scholars considered him a Muslim. We do not consider him a, a Muslim in the complete sense because he did not actually say Ashhadu la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah in terms of who became Muslim first. But God willing, he uh, is he is considered to have died uh, as a Muslim in terms of where he will be in al akhirah Wallahu a'lam. Um, second question. You mentioned the Sahaba left the seat of Khalifa out of their selflessness and knowing that this was not a position to gain but a huge responsibility. How can we incorporate that in our life? That's an excellent question. And um, because it's always good to derive lessons from what we're talking about. So that it is not just a story that we tell. Ultimately, you can apply it directly if you are put in such a position whereby you feel that there is someone else who is more worthy of that position and you are able to selflessly relinquish uh, that position and leave it to the other more worthy, more capable, more competent person. That's how you would benefit from it directly. Indirectly, it is by living our lives, not always seeking to be seen, not always seeking fame, right? But rather, not minding and not having a problem with sometimes being behind the scenes. And here I applaud the, the volunteers in the uh, revivers organization who are working and I'm sure a lot of them are unknown soldiers and they are behind the scenes and they played a big role in making uh, this event a success so not having a problem not minding to be behind the scenes not always wanting to be seen indeed a lot of the Sahaba especially when they became more famous they would have loved to be able to walk amongst the people and not be known. Things are exactly the opposite today. You know, I'm doing everything I can to get my face out there and to be known and for everyone to, to look at me and so on and so forth. But for them, this was the last thing on their mind. And uh, uh, what comes to mind is a beautiful saying of Imam al-Shafi'i where he said, I wish that all of the knowledge I spread could have uh, been done, but without and not through my name. And one may say, 
Because someone might say, okay, if, if I'm going to be so modest and so on, then I'm not going to be able to spread knowledge. I'm not going to be able, you know, to be known amongst others, to give a talk, to benefit people, and so on and so forth. Imam al-Shafi'i didn't say, I wish I didn't write so that nobody would know me. He said, I wish that my knowledge, the knowledge that I gave to people is still there, obviously, but I could care less whether it's in my name or in someone else's. That's tough. So imagine now, you have written a very interesting article, maybe even a book. And it spread like wildfire. But not with your name. There was a mistaken name. But the knowledge was disseminated. Would you be able to accept and say to yourself, Alhamdulillah, my goal has been achieved, the knowledge has spread, I could care less if it's in my name. Or are you gonna destroy the publisher and tell, what the hell do you think you're doing? It's not that easy. So, selflessness is the word, right? Yes, sir. is there anything else? Last question. What can we reply to someone who might say that it was unfair for Osman to receive a part of the booty of battle? <laughs> Wallahi, you can take it up with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's not with us today, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You can take it up with him on the Day of Judgment. Um, Similarly, you might say about the Pledge of Ridwan. Number one, the Prophet is not, uh, he cannot be questioned about something like this. However, if we try to think about it with our uh, minds, with our intellect, you might say that uh, why would he get some, uh, the, the same? Why don't you flip the question and say, why shouldn't he get part of it? Especially since the Prophet ﷺ is the one who told him that he should stay with uh, Ruqayya. So now, Uthman ibn Affan is not only staying with his wife, is not only staying with the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ, he is essentially doing something for the Khalifa. He is fulfilling a religious obligation. And he only missed Badr for that. Otherwise, he wouldn't have missed it. So it's only fair that, uh, that he get the reward and he get yani, a portion just like everyone else. And ultimately, this is something the, the, the Prophet ﷺ uh, gave him. And this is one of his, you know, this is something and a way that he honored Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu and something that he takes pride in. And by the way, as we just said, what was that uh, special and unique characteristic about the people of Badr? As the Prophet ﷺ said, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would say, do whatever you wish, people of Badr, I have forgiven you. Uthman already got that, that accolade somewhere else, Tabuk. When he funded Jaysh al-Usra with some 950 camels, 50 uh, horses, and some thousands of dirhams that he just threw in the lap of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, ma darra Uthman ma amila ba'da riyum. Uthman cannot do anything wrong after this. Isn't that essentially the same honor of the people of Badr? So you can say Uthman got it twice. Radiallahu anhu arda. Anything else? That's it, Shaykh. Barakallahu alaykum.